question. Uh, my title is perhaps a little bit pompous and a little bit generic, but that was uh, inspired by Eliezer, who, whenever I meet him, talks about degrees of freedom, and he always worries about them. Sometimes he has too many, and then he has too few. Sometimes he even has negative degrees of freedom. So I hope that I will bring this to a successful end, as far as he is concerned. <coughs> now, one of the problems is, of course, that I use the word M-theory, and we don't know what M-theory is. There are many definitions, and people use it in many different contexts. It is uh, certainly not 11-dimensional supergravity. Uh, it is also not the toroidal compactifications of uh, supergravity with an uh, EN group. Uh, even when you extend it with colossal client states, perhaps when you extend it with brains or whatever. Um, but even when you do this, you have to worry about 2B theory, which doesn't quite fit into the 11 dimensional scheme. It could be matrix theory or it could be M theory, and I'm sure there are many other possibilities. I'll start from the field theory side, assuming 32 supersymmetries all the time. And so, in some sense, I will be following a, follow a bottom-up approach, unlike Francois Angler, who had a top-down approach. And in this beautiful talk, he assumed a beautiful symmetry and then worked very hard to convince us that the degrees of freedom that he found had something to do with M theory. I will not give too many uh, references or listed here a name of the names of people with whom I worked in the last few years or discussed on this topic. Now, an artist's view of the degrees of freedom of N theory, if you start from the supergravity perspective, is roughly speaking the following. Here you have the 11 dimensional theory, which when you compactify down in a toroidal setting, then of course you generate the Kaluza Klein states, which are the half PPS states of the theory. And of course that number remains constant, that's why it's rectangular here. And it's clear that this is an incomplete theory. And I'll explain you why, or why you are already convinced of that. One of the problems here is also that there is the 2B theory, which is you look at this level, then it's certainly not contained in here, although some of the de degrees of freedom that you go to lower dimensions in a toroidal situation, they are the same. So I'll first discuss this a little bit, about the 2B versus the 11 dimensional theory. And what is relevant there is that the central charges in nine dimensions, which is a good thing to consider this. Uh, there are two types of central charges. One is in the doublet of the duality group, and then there's a non-simple non group. And the other one is in a singlet. And the situation is roughly speaking like this, that if you look at the um, kaluza klein states on the 11-dimensional side, I call those KKA, kaluza klein A states, then you have two A momentum states, which from the 11 dimensional sides of, in a doublet because of the symmetry of the M theory torus. And they split from the sting perspective in the Kaluza Klein states and the D0 brains. But from the 2B perspective, these are just the strings, the fundamental strings, and the D1 strings, the D strings. Uh, but they are the same states, of course, viewed from a different perspective. If you go to the KKB states, they are the uh, Kaluza Klein states that you find when you take the 2B theory and you look at a uh, compactification on a circle. And they are in a singlet, and that is clearly uh, reflected in the spectrum of the central charges because that's a singlet central charge. So this is the Kaluza Klein states on the 2B side, so they are the 2B momentum states, and they are the 2A winding states. So they are the strings in the uh, uh, in the, two B, in the 2A picture. Now, you can work this out all in detail, and it's, this is, of course, we did that in, several years ago, and it's, of course, related to what was mentioned this morning by Michael Green, the work of uh, John Swartz, where he, he identified these states as uh, the wrapping uh, states uh, around the uh, M theory torus, uh, Aspinall and Witten. Uh, but the noteworthy feature is that if you have these central charges, then the nine-dimensional supergravity theory should precisely have the gauge field in order to gauge these charges, because they appear on the right-hand side of the supersymmetry commutator. <coughs> so there is a consistency requirement there. And we conjectured at that time that these states, since they come in an equidistant spectrum, in fact signal that there are three more dimensions, which would bring the dimensions up to 12. And you would say, how could you have 32 supersymmetries in 12 dimensions? But the 
answer is that the 12 dimensional space would never be, you would never be able to decompactify it, so there would never be 12 dimensional Lorentz symmetry. So let me go to the anti symmetry commutator. Here you have the standard anti commutation relation, which is, you should all realize, is an empty relation because every term that could possibly appear on the right hand side is here. <coughs> and if you look at the central charges when you go down in the dimension, and you look at it in a tor toroidal setting, then you can try and see whether these central charges that you get, these things here, somehow combine in the lower dimensional field theory to something that, is, uh, that transforms consistently under the new duality group. And here I give you a table of that, and you see that in principle, well, here it's rather easy, this is the case I just discussed, and then all these objects here, they combine, and of course that means that the BPS states, the half BPS states that are generated by it, will be U-duality invariant. Um, but you also have to realize that this is because you take into account the five frame charges, and that is the reason why the Kaluza-Klein charge, the Kaluza-Klein states by themselves will never give a U-duality set of states. You always need extra states which are, not in the which are not in this rectangle, rectangle that I presented to you. The first point that you have a slight problem is here, where you get the central charges in the 27, and you get a 1 here. And the reason I say you have a problem is because the five-dimensional supergravity theory has 27 vector fields, and there is no singlet field to gauge this charge. So although it is in this set, it, doesn't, it seems to be missing here. But then below four dimensions, things go wrong, because you see that the um, central charges are representations now of the age group, the local, uh, locally realized group of the supergravity theory, and not of the usuality group. They just refuse to combine here. And you can, re well, you, there are different ways, and, and you know, this is, I'm not claiming that this is original. There are many papers where this is discussed, for instance, in the big paper by Obers and Piolin, these things are discussed, but not precisely in this way. Um, there is again a dual perspective. If you have these central charges on the, on the right hand side, then there should also be the gauge fields, and there are no gauge fields in this theory. And here you see that the gauge fields all match. This coincides precisely with the spectrum of gauge fields that you know from the extended supergravity theories, with the exception of this singlet here. You can go on, and you can, for instance, look at the string like central charges, and then you get this, and you get similar problems. You see here the green ones, there are no tensors in the five-dimensional theory in the 27 bar. By the way, this should be, oh no, this is a central charge, correct? And there is also not a singlet, but there are tensors in, in this representation here in the six-dimensional theory. So that matches, but this is clearly a mismatch. But then below five dimensions, everything is again wrong. You see there are the representation of the group H rather than of the U-duality group, and you don't know what to do with it. <coughs> These things do not seem to be around. <coughs> Now, what I'm going to present today is a completely new perspective on this, uh, on this question, and I don't, I don't really have an explanation for it, except that it's, it's, it's nice and it looks very consistent, but there's a story to be told which I'm not quite able to tell you. And that other perspective has to do with the deformations that you can have of these supergravity theories. Namely, you can, one of the, I think in some sense, the only deformation that we know <coughs> about the pure supergravity theories is that you can gauge them. And if you follow this, then, and, and you, well, you have to do it in a certain way, you will learn new things and you get a certain picture which coincides remarkably well with some of the other pictures, and that's what I want to show you. First of all, <coughs> in, when, you, when you go through the lower dimensional supergravities and toroidal compactifications, you do scalar vector tensor dualities all the time because you want to increase, you want to maximize the number of scalar fields and the low spin fields, because otherwise they are not combined into U-duality multiplets. So you have to do that. So just to give you a very simple and extreme example, in free space-time dimension, where you, after you dualize, you get 128 scalars and you get 128 spinners. And the 128 spinners are precisely, I mean, this is consistent with U-duality because this is a linearly realized version of E8 over SO16. Um, so th there is absolutely no problem here, but there are no vectors left. So if you want to gauge this theory, it seems that you can never do it. 
But this question was resolved by uh, Zandleben and Nikolai a while ago. Normally the solution is that you can add 248 vector gauge fields, at least potentially, uh, in principle, by writing them with a churn simons term, which is proportional to the gauge coupling constant. So that means they do not, they do not co coincide with dynamic modes. You can simply introduce them, and by having these vector fields, then you can gauge them to the scalars of this theory. Now there is a particular object here which defines how the gauge group that you will have the end. Not all of these vector fields are going to be gauged, so they are not necessarily coupling to anything else in the Lagrangian. Uh, and that subgroup is defined by this object here, which is the embedding tensor. And I will come to this in a moment because it plays a very important role. Now as soon as you go back to the, to the toroidal truncation, then of course this all disappears. These degrees of freedom decouple. And the idea here is, from the perspective of M-theory, that there is something in the degrees of freedom of M-theory which act as order parameters, which sort of excite these gauge fields so that you get a gauged version. But if you don't have these objects there, then this term simply disappears from the Lagrangian and you're back to the toroidally compactified theory, the low energy theory. Now, let me give you another example, which I will use a lot to explain another aspect of this. In fine space-time dimension, you have 42 scalars and you have 27 vectors, and you have no tensors. And again, of course, the original theory, it did have tensors, but I compactify, I dualize them as much as I could to vectors, because otherwise, you see the 27 I need in order to build up a representation of the E6 duality group. So, now you can introduce, now you have the vector field, so that doesn't seem to be a problem, and you introduce a local subgroup into this, uh, you, you know, into this E6. And for instance, you take SO6, which is the standard gauging of uh, the five-dimensional theory by Romans, uh, uh, Gunaiden, and Warner. And so you embed the SO6 in here, and you're left with an extra SL2. There are other embeddings possible, but let's take this one here. And now you see that something strange is happening, because if you take the vector fields, which transform according to the 27 bar in my notation, they decompose under this group in the following way. They build up a 15 plat, which are obviously the gauge fields associated with the SO6, and then there are other gauge fields which are in the 6 bar 2 representation of this group. And you know that that cannot work, because you know that if you have a non abelian gauge group, you cannot add charge vector fields. So something is inconsistent with this thing here, and you have to change something. And what was changed by Gunaiden et al. was that these, these vector fields here were then reconverted into tensor fields. So first you had written everything in vector fields, then you tried to gauge, it didn't work, and then you reconvert it in some vague way. Now the gauge group that you want to choose here is, is encoded into an embedding matrix tensor, and I already told you that this is a very crucial object. So this embedding tensor tells you this M is the index in the representation of the vector field. So in this case, M belongs to the 27 bar. And alpha refers to all the generators of the E6 group. So if you know this object, you know exactly which particular linear combinations of the E6 generators you take, and you build the group from that. Now, this embedding tensor I regard as a spurionic order parameter. So this is something that I don't know about M M theory yet which is excited in the theory, it may be a brain configuration, it could be all sorts of things. And somehow in this theory it reflects itself by inducing this gauging to the theory. And I call it spurionic because I, although this thing is frozen to a constant eventually, I will treat it for the moment as something that actively transforms under the E6 group. And in that, doing it that way, I can do group theory and I can characterize this tensor in the usual way I should do with spurions, I can characterize this completely group theoretically. And that is really the, the, the new insight. So here, so I regard this as a probe of new M-theory degrees of freedom and afterwards you may decide what these new M-theory degrees of freedom are. And I have something to say about that, but it's not very deep, but there are some coincidences. So here once more, you have the generators of the gauge group, and they are written by these, this embedding tensor in terms of the E6 generators. Now, of course, taking an arbitrary object here doesn't guarantee that you have a group, so you appreciate, you, you realize that this thing here, this theta, must satisfy certain constraints. 
So what are these constraints in this particular case? <coughs> so there are two constraints. First of all, there's a closure constraint. You see these axes, which are the generators of the gauge group that I'm going to start with, have to close. I don't know what these structure constants are, because if I start with the embedding tensor, I do not a priori know which group I'm going to generate. It's already questionable whether I will be generating any group. So if you look at this particular relation and you, and you decompose it in the embedding tensor, then you get the relation between the embedding tensor squared times the structure constant of E6, which has to be equal to this object here times theta. And then this has to be equal to, for the consistency of the theory, everything you know acts on the fields according to the uniform expression theta times the t's, which is the x acting on the embedding tensor. Because that is the way in which all the transformations are induced on the fields. So if I write it like this, you see that I have a quadratic constraint in theta here, whereas these, this object here, t and f, are simply the generators in the adjoint and in the fundamental representation of E7. So I have a completely group theoretical problem, and the statement is that I only generate the group when this complicated constraint is satisfied. <coughs> now, I also use this I can write in the following way, where X, M, and P is the generator X in the representation, in the fundamental representation, which refers to the vector fields. So this looks like a structure constant, but it isn't. It contains the structure constant, but only in the part which is projected onto the embedding tensor. So this thing is not even symmetric, anti-symmetric in M and N as a structure constant. Only when you contract it, like you here, you have contracted it with an X, which contains the embedding tensor. This thing here now is anti-symmetric. But if I would take this X away, then there are components in this tensor which are not anti-symmetric. Now, the second constraint is a linear constraint, and this follows from supersymmetry. It turns out that you cannot just use any embedding tensor. The embedding tensor has to, re has to belong to a certain representation, and this e the representation is the 351. And you will see it already in the Romans paper, and many of these things were already known before that. So, to see what the consequence of this is, you see this is a tensor which has a lower index M and an adjoint index alpha, so it's in the 27 times 78. If you branch that, and don't worry about these representations, you can work that out on the computer nowadays, then you get this result, and it tells you that this thing only can belong to this representation, but not to these two. Now, once you know that this is in the 351, that you know that this constraint here must be in the symmetric product of two 351s, because this is quadratic to a commuting quantity theta. And if you branch that out, you see that you get all these fantastic representations. And then this constraint tells you precisely that these two representations have to be absent. So you can nowadays on the computer, by working out branchings and doing it in different things and overlaying them, you can find group theoretical identities of which you had no idea how to prove them if you didn't have a specific representation. So this is all that is worth, that is worth knowing in some sense in the five-dimensional theory, but I'll continue with the five-dimensional theory because it's a nice example. Now we know for every supergravity theory now for, with a gauging, we know what the embedding tensor, what it should be, how it is restricted by supersymmetry. And here you see the list. I didn't go to higher dimensions because then the, the U-duality group is uh, reducible and it's not so interesting and it branches out in small representation and it didn't go below 3. So here you see that in 7 dimensions, for instance, the 15 plus 40, that's the first time that it is, well, it's not the first time that's reducible, but it is reducible. In 6 dimensions, the 448. Here you see the 351. Here the 912, which was already known in uh, the early 80s when, uh, when it was first done. That was a 912, but it was not understood in this way. And in the 3 dimensions, it has to be in this particular representation. I'm not going to pronounce these numbers all the time. So what do you see? First of all, and I'm not going to show you that, this characterizes all the group, the, the, the possible gaugings of the supergravity theory. Everything is in principle now known about any gauging. If you look for the literature, there's now a literature of almost 30 years engaging these theories, and the first 20 years, hardly anything was known. There were a couple of gaugings were known, there were a few constructions, and then there were variations of these constructions. But now it's all 
known. And there is a group theoretical classification, and the Lagrangian is universal, by which I mean the following, just like in Yang-Mills. If you write down one gauge theory, like Yang and Mills did with Fresher 2, you know, you, you think this is very special. You have no idea that there's a group behind it and you can do a Fresher 3 until you realize that there is just one Lagrangian for gauge theory, but it only depends on the structure constants of the gauge theory. In this here situation, here is exactly the same. There is one universal Lagrangian for the theory, which depends on the embedding tensor, and the embedding tensor tells you precisely which gauge group it is. And of course, you have to show that there is a Lagrangian which describes all that only subject to these two conditions. And here I give you a number of applications where this has all been shown in great detail. So let's have a small digression here. If I consider the representations appearing in the symmetric product of the 27s, I get two representations here. Now if I look at this object here, which was more than just the structure constant that I told you, and which had a symmetric part, if I take the symmetric part, it could be that there is a combination, there is an invariant tensor which connects this to another tensor, which is either, the index i is either referring to the 27 bar, or to the 351 prime. And the question is, which, which one is it? It could be a sum of both representations, but you have to remember that this was an irreducible 351. So there is only one. And again, by means of the computer, you can figure out that there is only one representation appearing here, which is the 27 bar. So uh, you see that here, because if you take the 27 times 27 symmetric times 27 bar, there is the 351 in here, and that is this 351 here. And this tensor here, therefore, if this is an index, say, n, has to be also in the 350. And that is confirmed, because if you take the 27 bar times 27 bar anti-symmetric, you again find the 351. It's very simple nowadays by, with the computer. You can de deduce these relationships, and occasionally you have to fit a couple of constants in some sense. And in this particular case, this is just a symmetric tensor of the E6 theory, and this is the proper identity. <coughs> now, again, from the constraints and playing this game for a little while, you find that there is an orthogonality condition. The, the index, the tensor Z, which is the same 351 written in a different form, when you contract it with theta, it is orthogonal to that. This will be important in a moment. And you can also show that this tensor Z is an invariant tensor. It's a gauge invariant tensor, not only six invariant tensor, but a gauge invariant tensor. And this structure is completely generic, at least for all the groups of interest. Uh, it works in exactly the same way. So I'm not going to go in any detail and bore you with group theory uh, for the other cases. So then the next step is that rather than converting or converting the, the tensors into vectors, as we did originally, and then reconverting some of them when we switch on the gauging, because this part I sort of left out now, uh, we introduce the vectors and the tensors from the start. So we take the vectors in the 27 bar representation, and we take all of them, and we simply add the vectors in the 27 representation, so that in principle we can accommodate any possible gauging. And how does this work? Well, this works by introducing extra gauging variant. Namely, this is the non-ability transformation. Here you see the x, but you know that the axes do not close, because this thing only closes when it acts on the embedding tensor. So there is a certain leakage in the algebra, which is expressed by this, and since this z was orthogonal on the embedding tensor, this thing simply can gauge away the tensors where you have, the vectors where you have no closure. Then in order to, that means also that the field strength that you built in this particular case, it's not fully covariant, doesn't make any sense. So you introduce a full covariant field strength, which is the original one, plus, and now you have the tensor field here, which is because this thing was in the 27 bar representation, this one is in the 27 representation. And now you dictate that this thing is covariant, which implies that B has to transform in a certain way. So you see it's a tensor gauge field with lots of complicated terms here, proportional to the gauge group parameters and the tensor gauge transformations. So what you achieve in this way, which looks like a very simple recipe, and you wonder whether it should work in general and so on, but in all these cases it works, is that because of the extra gauge invariance, you can check that the degrees of freedom always remain unchanged. So that means that if you want to have this is of six gauging, this 
extra gauge invasion allows you to get rid of these extra 12 gauge fields, which were inconsistent, but then you will, it's, instead, you will have 20, 12 of these tensor fields back, and there is still a full balance of the case of freedom. So that's why, at that point, everything is becoming grouped theoretically, and you, you can discuss any case because it depends on this embedding tensor, which is sitting, which is hidden in all these objects here, which simply tells you tell what embedding tensor you want, you check whether it satisfies the constraints, and if it does, then you simply switch it on, and these things are given once and for all. So once you switch the gauging, there will be a balanced decomposition of vectors and tensors, and you don't have to go sort of reconvert everything and go back. And I, just to give you an example of this universal invariant Lagrangian, uh, for instance, let me show you the kinetic terms for the tensor field. They're here, and they need an antisymmetric tensor, which happens to be there in this particular case, although you know, the group theory didn't know about five dimensions, but here it is. And you see one of the pieces which doesn't contain a gauge coupling constant is the churn simons term of the five-dimensional supergravity theory, which you get for free. It's completely implied by the gauge symmetry. Not, I haven't used any supersymmetry here. So this term is present for all the gaugings, and if you go to the gaugings that are known, you see that most of these terms cancel out because there is something very simple in the gauging, and many of these terms do not contribute. But in principle, they are all there. Now the question is, can this be generalized? Suppose that this is, you know, this seems to be universal. And, you know, when you want to go through this exercise, you run into this problem and you start explaining certain things. And then you say, look, maybe we can always do this. And, what, and we can continue this procedure. So this brings me to hierarchies of vectors and tensors. And now the setup is as follows. You start, and the interesting thing is I'm not using supersymmetry at the moment. I'm not even using which space time symmetry I am. So I start with a gauge algebra. I have an embedding tensor and I have the gauge fields. And I have a certain group. I don't tell you which group it is in principle. Of all, for practice, I will use the five-dimensional group, the one in uh, uh, E6 for the five-dimensional theory. So I know that everything, when I multiply this with the embedding tensor, that there is complete closure. Everything is fine. But there is a leakage, so I have the transformation rules of this field, and because this is not really a structure constant, this thing leaks, but there is an extra gauge invariance which I introduced here, which introduces now, which absorbs this lack of closure, which allows me to gauge away these vector fields and convert them to tensors. Now I go on, I introduce the tensor fields B, and now Z times, you see now I, I'm not assuming any particular representation for B, and here, this thing also closes up to some point, and then it closes when I multiply it with z, but I can find a tensor which is orthogonal to this z, so which takes, you know, which can compensate for the lack of closure. So when I do this, I need something that is orthogonal, and I can, in this case, I can even explicitly construct that tensor out of the z's and the properties that I know for the axis. So it's completely closed, and I have absolutely no reason why this you know, explanation why this should work, but it works. Now I can continue because if I now make an invariant field strength for B, it will not be covariant and I need something in the covariant field strength to repair the damage and I will have a free index gauge field, which transforms like that. Now, that is the same file that I have here. In five dimensions I didn't see this free index gauge field because there was a Z acting on B and that killed off this term. So the Lagrangian didn't contain this field phi. So therefore, from the Lagrangian, I would never see it, but since I'm not working on the Lagrangian here, I could just continue my procedure and find more terms. And then I build up a whole thing, a whole hierarchy of vectors and tensors of higher and higher rank. Now, you may wonder what's good it does, but of course, you will see at some point that you really need this. So here I give you, just to show you the results, it gets rather complicated, but Interestingly enough, it works completely and exactly and uh, without any further constraints. Here you see the index, the field strength of the tensor field. And you see that there are these churn simons modifications that we know in many cases to appear. And then we see here this extra leakage term with the free index tensor field. And if you then dictate that this thing should transform covariantly, then this is the transformation rule for this tensor field. So I have a sort of a plumbing strategy here. I have a gauge algebra which is leaking all the time. 
And every time when it leaks, I introduce a new tensor field. And the group theory, for some reason, is always kind and is always doing its best to make life easy for me. And so I can go on. So I start with A, there's some leakage, I have a B, and then I have an S, and so on. Now this appears, this is not just uh, something that, you know, we, we didn't work this out for every level, of course, but we know of cert certain supergravities where we have to go this high. And so that this is the result. So what we see here is we, we have, again, a list of dimensions from 3 to 7, and here you have the usuality group, and here you have the number of vector fields, so they will rank 1 fields. So you know that they have t 10 vector fields in 7 dimensions, 16, and, six, and so on. And I, to generate this table, I only use the group theory. So I don't even know that I am in a certain space-time dimension. I simply take a vector, and then I get a tensor, and then I get a two-index tensor, and a three-index tensor, and so on. And of course, I didn't continue at infinitum because it would be very hard. But this is what I sort of get. You see, I told you in three dimensions I had a 248 because these were the gauge fields of V8. And then I found that there was something in the 3875. And what was that something? This is the embedding tensor. In four dimensions, I have 56 gauge fields because I get the vector, the electric and the magnetic gauge fields. And then I get the tensors in the 133. And this whole column we have completely worked out. <coughs> then you go higher up, the next level, the one that I called S, the free index gauge fields. And we also looked at those. And then we see precisely this. We see a 5 bar here, a 16 bar here. And some of these fields you haven't seen. You see, this field you have never seen in four-dimensional supergravity because you have never seen the tensors. The theory, the Lagrangian doesn't need it, but the hierarchy in principle allows it. And then the next one here is the embedding tensor again. I'll tell you a little bit about this one in a moment. Then here you see the 78, which again, the five-dimensional theory doesn't need. So you don't see it in the Lagrangian, but the group theory tells you that it could perfectly well be there. And here you see the embedding tensor. And here you see the six-dimensional one, and here you see the seven-dimensional one. And the seven-dimensional one, we know that for gauge handle gauges, we need both the two-rank tensor and the three-rank tensor. So that's a case where we really know that we need these things and when they are not killed by the Lagrangian. Now, what is this column here? And I have to stress, we didn't check all these numbers yet. This one is precisely the content of the quadratic constraints on the embedding tensor. And here, they appear precisely at that place where the rank of the tensor field is equal to the dimension. The embedding tensor itself appears when the rank is equal to the dimension minus 1. So there are some striking features here, which I already mentioned a little bit. Like in the D minus 2 tensors, these are these ones, they are always in the adjoint representation. You see the 45 of this one here and the 24 of that one over there. And I stress, I only used group theory. I didn't even use M theory, although I was biased in my choice of the group. Now, there is another thing which is really miraculous. That is, that it shows the Hodge duality of, that is implied by the space-time. Although I didn't put in space-time, you see the two and the three rank tensors are precisely dual in the usual tensor-tensor duality structure. In this particular, in this, the 10 and the 10 are also dual in this particular case. In six dimension, the 16 and 16 bar are dual. In five dimension, the 27 bar and the 27 are dual. And here, the 56 is self-dual, so there is no issue. So, although I didn't use space-time, this is all coming out of this, of this construction, which is a very logical construction if you want to spend mm -hmm. 10 years of your life working out gaugings. But of course, that is not the idea why we push this. The thing is that we saw a pattern, and the pattern seems to be telling us something that is new. Now, what is the remarkable thing here now? That is, this is the same table, and this table coincides substantially with previous tables, which are really closer to M theory in many ways. They are really close to brain configurations and so on. And the previous work that I'm referring to has completely different conceptual starting points. There is matrix theory here, and I'll just give you the reference in a moment, and then Eliezer will be back, and he can worry, because he is one of the authors on that paper. 
and he told me that he was on that paper because he was worrying about the decrease of freedom. <laughs> and there is another paper here which has some, has, is related to the Torel de Compactification event theory, the relation and del Pezzo surfaces, which seems to be something totally different. And here are these papers. There's this paper here. All these authors are present in, at this meeting, so they can all comment on this relationship. <coughs> and this is based on matrix theory, based matrix theory with the U-duality group, building up the, the while group of the U-duality group and building on the representation. And when I go back, I think, uh, I may be wrong, but I think what they give mostly are these numbers here, of course there are in, there, are income, there are states missing here and there, if I remember correctly. It's not, it doesn't fill up completely. They have nothing about the higher uh, order states. But then the amazing thing is that in this paper, by Iqbal and Netsken and Vafa, which appear, which is a more recent paper, uh, which is called The Mysterious Duality, and I could have called this talk also A Mysterious Duality, if, I, if the title hadn't been used by someone else before. Uh, this table was completely was produced here with the following exceptions. It doesn't contain the last one, the, the d-dimensional tensor fields. And here it only gives the 15 and not the 40. And I have no way of, there's no way of telling for me why, whether they missed this from their perspective or this is a significant omission or what's going on. Uh, this is all that I can tell you about this. So the situation at this term is that it is, the, the conclusion is that it is important to uncover the physical interpretation of these duality relations. And here one possibility is that the del Pezzo surface is the moduli space of some probe, U-duality invariant probe and M-theory. And I didn't invent these sentences because I, they're almost verbally cited from the paper by, uh, uh, by Vafa and collaborators. So it looks as if the gauging, the deformations, it's sort of the only thing that you can do in the, on the supergravity side, on the field theory side. And it seems to build up the things that we know are there and that we love and so on. And they seem to be there and they seem to also be completely consistent with the duality theory. So I think this is a very sort of unexpected relationship. It's not that it is not logical or so. I, I don't think there should be any psychological problem, but it's really hinting to something more. So another pressing question then is this picture. And I was wondering what they were thinking. And in the context of this talk, I think this is what they were saying or they were thinking. <laughs> so on a personal note, I want to thank Eliezer and Shimon for their hospitality extended to me during my many visits here and for their friendship. And I want to close congratulating them once more with their birthdays. Thank you. Well, there's plenty of time for uh, questions. Remarks, comments? Uh, well, if I only generate a hierarchy, it could be ghost fields. If, if I would only be generating the hierarchy, yeah. you know, getting a higher and higher rank tensor fields, yeah. then of course you could say, well, you know, how do you know? And I would, I don't think I have an answer at this point. But I know the theories, like in the in seven dimensions, yeah. I have the, the two index and the three index tensor fields. And I know that some of the extra get tensor fields that I get at some point are not present in the Lagrangian. So at that point, I cannot, there is no statement about whether they are ghosts or not. Okay? But it could, of course, be that if you, you know, you, you're quite right. From the hierarchy side, there is no way of telling. But this is the mystery. You see, you're, you, you're doing, in some sense, I wouldn't say it's boring, but, but it is, once you understand that this is what you have to do, it is straightforward and it's work. And you generate things 
and you, you have the feeling that there is no information about certain things, and the information then comes out. That is the mystery of this whole thing. No, no, no. No, no. That was the, remember this embedding tensor. So first of all, I start with supergravity, and I pick the groups from that. Then I have the embedding tensor, and there is one constraint on the embedding tensor, which comes from supersymmetry. And that was this constraint that it was in the 912 or the 351, or so the the representation of the embedding tensor that is given by supersymmetry and supersymmetry alone. Yes. You construct the complete bosonic part of a supersymmetric supergravity action. Yes, and at that point, as I stressed, I'm not even using the space time dimension. But do you get supersymmetric? Sorry? At the end, do you get something which is fully supersymmetric? Well, in this particular case, I know all the theories. You see, I have, it hasn't been worked out for all the supergravity theories, but I know when I go through the group theoretical analysis, then from all the theories that have been worked out in complete detail, I know that I, when I switch on that embedding, in, in, in a permissible uh, embedding tensor, I have a gauging of that theory. And, and, and of course, you know, coming back to Julius's question, then I know that all the tensor fields which appear in the supergravity theory, they will not be ghosts, because there is a balance of degrees of freedom. That's guaranteed. The invisible tensor fields which are absent in the Lagrangian, I cannot make a statement about. Very much.